Denise Moyo was born in Zimbabwe, and she moved to the United States and attended Boston University, and she is a licensed clinical social worker and also a licensed applied behavioral analyst. Denise, as poet, uses poetry to speak on issues of trauma and emotional pain, and her poetry in its offering is prayerful, transformative, and healing. And she has four books of her poetry, some that are with us today. And you can learn more about her at her website. And I am delighted that she's here to share her poetry. Please welcome with me, Denise Moyo. My mother is a pastor and my dad is a pastor. So when I see anything that looks like a pulpit, it's very hard for me to sort of get off. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I, I kind of need that wave to say it's time for you to move. But I'm very excited to be here this morning to share some of my poetry with you. I usually like to start with a song. You know, growing up in the church, music becomes something that grounds you. And... Um, the song that I want to share with you, I'm just going to share a little part of the song. It's, uh, the song is titled, In Your Presence. And I wrote it because I needed God's presence, because I felt like God had abandoned me. You know, growing up in the church, I felt so connected to God. And then at some point, because of events that had occurred in my life, I began to feel that separation from God. I write in one of my poems, Impartation, that I felt like I had been divorced by God. That's how severe the feeling that I had of the separation that I felt. So I'm just going to sing that song to kind of ground me, and then we'll jump into the poetry that I'm here to share with you. <clears throat> in your presence, in your presence, your glory, Lord, in your glory, Lord, in your presence, in your presence, in your glory, Lord, in your glory, I want to walk in your presence, in your presence. In your presence, in your glory, Lord, in your glory, let me walk in your presence, in your presence, in your presence, in your glory, Lord, in your glory, Lord. For a long time, that has been the story in the background of the way that I live my life, craving, needing God's presence. I talk about how my faith became so shaky, and I was constantly asking, where is God? Where is God when he's needed? And I know some of you have asked that question. There's a verse in the Bible that, in Matthew, where Jesus says to the disciples, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and the mountain will move. But I write in one of my poem, Faith, and I say, faith so uncertain, seeds look like mountains. Because from where I stood in the pain that was within me, the seed, the mustard seed, might, might as well be Mount Kilimanjaro. And the next line when God says, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there. Well, I felt like I had become the mountain that needed to move from here to there. When I write the line in my poem, from here to there, I say, we have become the mountains that need to move from here to there. Because that's the great thing about poetry, right? We can hide in we. 
because it felt too personal to say I. I have become the mountain that needed to move, so we have become the mountains that need to move. That's what I like about poetry, because it's so easy to confront things and address things that we usually don't talk about in our daily lives. Experiences of trauma can often leave us paralyzed emotionally, alive, but not living. It is from this place that I wrote my poem, How Do You Exercise the Spirit? It's a dream and yet I am awake. I keep waiting for this one thing to happen so that I can begin my journey. It never happens, so I'm always waiting. I promise myself, tomorrow is the day. Tomorrow always comes and the sun sets itself, knowing perfectly well I'll be exactly where it left me. Tonight as I waited, I heard a group of people arguing about God. I couldn't understand most of what they were saying. It seemed to me they were making a play out of vocabulary that I've never heard, but never quite getting to a point. They can't get to any point. They don't know who they are. A voice behind me proclaimed. I thought to myself, as I often do, if they knew what I know, they would realize who they truly are. <sighs> With a heavy sigh, the voice now in front of me said, if you knew yourself, you would have arrived by now. In that moment, I realized that my spirit had become despondent and could no longer will me anywhere. How do you exercise the spirit, I asked. But the voice had already departed, for another day had already started. I watched the sun rise with a smile on its face, and instead of joy, I was filled with humiliation. Like always, I was still stuck in the same place, waiting. Twenty years later, I'm still waiting for that one thing to happen so that I can begin my journey. I ask again, how do you exercise the spirit? Now the answer that came to me is that we exercise our spirits by using our pain to create something. By finding someone with the similar pain that you are carrying and helping them in a significant way. That is how we exercise our spirits. And each time I stand and share my story with people, it forces me to look out of myself, out of my pain. And because trauma always comes with isolation, sharing our stories can help us feel connected. And one thing that I've seen that intensifies trauma or emotional pain, it is the belief that I am the only one suffering, that I am the only one going through such pain. And as we share our stories, we can shatter that belief and lessen the pain that we carry. Because it's not that we want other people to suffer, it's that it's really, really hard to suffer by yourself. And so when we know, when we can recognize our stories in other people, when we can recognize our pain in other people, we also recognize the strengths in other people. We recognize the strategies that they have used to overcome their pain and know that we too can overcome. 
we recognize the hope that they carry. And that also gives us hope that we can survive. I want to touch on one of the experiences that often lead to trauma, and that is abuse. Through my purse. You go through my purse looking for sin. And when you find none, you insert me with your own sin, tainting my body, my soul, my mind, and my spirit. You investigate all the dark areas that you say remind you of a color lily, the deepest shade of purple, looking for passion you don't deserve. You consume the depth of my being until I am unable to fight with my fist, unable to stand on my feet, unable to say a thing as if my mouth is tightly covered by an invisible hand. You go through my purse looking for power. And after you take it, you insert me with your weakness, tainting my body, my soul, my mind, and my spirit. You investigate all the dark areas that you say remind you of a color, lily, the deepest shade of purple, and steal the desire to live. Does not this type of pain infect the womb meant to carry life? Does it not damage the heart meant to love and nurture? Does it not lead to self-destructive habits in the one now burdened by a void where the desire to live used to preside? Talking about experiences of pain or events that lead to trauma is often difficult. In fact, I never told my parents about my own story of abuse. It is not until I was an adult that I felt empowered to start sharing my story. And as I've started to share my story, I realized that it's not just sharing the story that is difficult. It is also listening to stories of pain, stories of trauma. That's very difficult to do. Hearing stories of trauma often comes with the burden of knowing. Most people don't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to say, so I'd rather not hear. Sometimes, as Cheryl said, people have their own traumas that they are already carrying, right? And so hearing someone else's story of trauma sort of triggers that pain. So it's hard to listen. And sometimes people find it difficult to take action. In a poem that I shared Last month when I was here, bystanders, there's a line that says, silence is not always golden. Sometimes peace is worth disturbing. But it's really hard to disturb the peace in the places that we live in or the places that we work in where these events of trauma sometimes occur. The next poem that I'm going to share is, I smile when it hurts. To continue hiding the truth would have killed me. Yet telling the truth still brought many repercussions. My truth, my downfall, my downfall, my truth. Becoming aware of the truth brings with it the demand to do something about it. So no one wanted my truth. I gave it anyway. That was my offense. Resentment followed, 
because by divulging the truth, many were now forced to carry the burden of knowing. They would have rather I spared them the headache, but pretending had become unbearable for me. Smiling when it hurt and laughing the tears away had become detrimental to my soul. At some point, the pain began to ooze out, no longer willing to be masked, refusing to stay hidden within. The sky is blue, the grass is green. That's as true as the truth that I spoke. My truth, my downfall, my downfall, my truth. So now, once again, I smile when it hurts. <laughs> So because we are constantly afraid to disturb the peace, we don't share our stories. Because we don't want to pass on the burden of knowing, we don't share our stories. That often means that we have to carry our stories and our pain alone. And when we carry pain alone, we can lose a sense of who we are. And when our pain is not seen, we start to think that we are the ones that are not being seen. And when people feel unseen, they often do all kinds of things, usually self-destructive, just to be seen. And I address this in my poem, The Inner Child. The inner child. The inner child strives to escape the feeling of being invisible. It's a difficult task to untangle oneself from the pain of living life unseen. Desperate for a helping hand, lost in the absence of empathy. Desperate measures are taken just to check if the world has eyes that see because it goes on blind to the suffering the child is facing. Great heights are traveled, destructive steps taken, just to check if the world still has a pulse, because it goes on unresponsive, indifferent to the child's pleas for help. Displays of desperation turned inside out become the way the inner child verifies its liveliness, causing further harm to the person. See me, demands the child inside. Am I alive? Can, can anyone see me? Notice the hurt. Notice my pain. To a damaged spirit, one's existence and worth are only realized when acknowledged by other people. It's so easy for the child inside to get lost, searching for evidence of its own heartbeat, for proof of life often ending up stuck in avalanches of shame with masses pointing fingers in a twisted way. Finally, a confirmation that yes, you are visible. We see you. You are alive. It takes working through the many layers of mental chaos and internal discord to realize one's own worth. 
making it possible to regain control of one's life. Only then can the inner child be convinced to let go of events that have traumatized existence. Only then can the child within choose the path of healing rather than the path of destruction. And only then can the person choose life, not death. I started by asking, how do we exercise our spirit? I found that forgiveness is another way that we can exercise our spirit. Forgiveness always seems like it's a gift for other people, but what I've seen is that forgiveness is actually for us. Because when we forgive, we can start the healing process. And it's really difficult to start that healing process when we're unable to forgive, when we're unwilling to forgive. Because by hanging on and refusing to forgive, we cling to the pain instead of moving towards the healing. The poem that I'm going to share next is the past must be faced. I woke up free of dread and was grateful. For the longest time, I had sought control that I could never establish. I was trapped in a cycle of nightmares that often ended with me in a swamp. I detested the nights and dreaded the mornings, until one day I read something that changed my world and led me to a place of peace. By helping me confront the past I had vowed to avoid. By trying so hard to avoid the past, I had constantly found myself back in it. The past must be faced in order to be resolved. This is what I read. And this is what changed my life. I had completely blocked mine. Pretending it never was, I never was, but it was and I was. You can't solve what you do not face. And because life is a balancing act, refusing to deal with it emotionally meant I had to deal with it physically. Finally, I spoke the words that released me from what had seemed to me a spell that could never be broken. First, by facing my pain and reminding myself that I was now free and safe. Then by moving on to the next phase, which I still repeat every night. Here's my forgiveness. I give it truly and freely because it is always in me waiting to embrace you. Take it if you want it. Use it if you need to. I no longer worry about the past because once resolved, the past belongs to the past. Now I choose to spend each moment finding every bit of light within me and using it to create something magnificent.
And I want to thank you so much for listening. And I encourage all of you to have the courage to share your stories and to be willing to listen to other people's stories because there's always lessons that hide in there. Thank you so much. Did you know there are other ways to reduce your pain besides taking medications? For example, mindfulness. I'm Dr. Mike Guidi, a family medicine doctor based in Essex County. I use mindfulness techniques with my own patients during office visits, and I'm here to tell you how you can prevent addiction. It is a way to train your brain to manage pain. Reducing your pain through mindfulness could mean you need less medication or a safer type of medication. It can also help you reduce your stress and recover from past trauma. That means you become less likely to develop an addiction, whether opioids, alcohol, or any other substance. In brain research, we scan people's brains before they start practicing mindfulness, and after they've been practicing it daily for eight weeks. We see actual changes in the way their brains are wired. We see those people drawing more on their judgment and reasoning skills, resulting in safer behaviors. Massachusetts has great resources about effective mindfulness techniques. To find out more, go to massmed.org. A gun? I'm Haley. Hi, hi, Davis. Jake. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Al and Gal, and we love H Camp. I want to be a camp. We love H Camp. And I volunteer for H Camp TV. And I watch H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. We love H Camp TV. Are you worried about letting your child take the wheel? Maybe you should also be worried about what you're doing behind the wheel. Have you ever sent a quick text just this once? Well, that might turn into a catastrophic accident. Monkeys see what monkey do. If you do it, why wouldn't your child? In a child's brain, almost all things their parents do, they can do too. 78% of teen drivers' surveys text and drive. 59% said their parents do it too. Stop texting and driving because if you do it, your child will too.